Hello, and welcome to the Stanford Med Matters series. I'm your host, Daryl Oaks, and I am a practicing physician and specialist in cardiothoracic anesthesiology, and I am the Associate Dean for Postgraduate Medical Education and CME here at Stanford. On this program, we will be meeting experts to explore hot topics in medicine that impact your practice, your patients, and your world. Today, we will be talking with Stanford Business School professor Jeffrey Pfeffer about power and influence. We will be discussing why understanding the dynamics of power is critical for us to better serve our patients. We will be exploring how power dynamics in healthcare can distort incentives in ways that may negatively impact our patients and healthcare professionals. Professor Pfeffer is a renowned professor of organizational behavior at Stanford Graduate School of Business. Professor Pfeffer's work has been really instrumental in helping us understand the complexities of power dynamics, leadership myths, and evidence-based management. He is the author of numerous best-selling books, including Power, Why Some People Have It and Others Don't, Leadership BS, and most recently, The Seven Rules of Power. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to hear from Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer today. So welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you. Before we get into the discussions of the principles of individual power, which is something you've written a lot about, I think it's really helpful for us to explore a little bit about power dynamics and how they impact physicians and healthcare professionals in the broader context of the medical workplace. You have described in the past this concept that medicine has become more financialized and that this has become very significant and, and a challenge to many of the structures in our current healthcare landscapes. And so if you could explain a little bit about what this means and how this influences the way we care for patients and how this may influence access to care and quality. Mm-hmm. Medicine, of course, is a healing art. It's a healing profession. And uh, the, the patient's And the research that makes patient care better has been at the the core of medical practice for a long time. Much more recently, there has been uh, an influence of financial considerations. As many of your viewers and listeners will know, private equity is buying up practices in dermatology and emergency medicine and gastroenterology. And of course, private equity is concerned mostly about returns. And there is, of course, evidence that suggests that when private equity buys up a medical practice, the price goes up and the quality goes down. So that's one aspect of financialization. Another aspect of financialization is that the private equity, if you will, mindset of the concern for money above all else, has come to pervade really all kinds of medical institutions, including nonprofits, including actually Stanford, and including many nonprofits. Part of the trend is reflected in the changing role of and the changing employment circumstances of physicians. Now, at one point, physicians were mostly independent professionals. Now, 70% are employees. And there was an interesting article in the New York Times that described the moral dilemma that physicians face. Because on the one hand, they have taken the Hippocratic Oath. They've gone into a healing profession in order to try to make patients better and heal disease and provide treatment. But on the other hand, they are now under increasing financial pressure to maximize revenues, to minimize costs. And so the two things, I want to take care of patients, I want to make a ton of money, don't always coincide. And so that is, that's the, the dilemma I think that physicians face. There's also research that suggests that over the years, the power in the medical profession has shifted. At one point, doctors ran hospitals. And now the doctor, now the last, uh, there's some study that I saw in a major medical journal that said out of maybe 6,000 medical facilities, doctors only ran about 500. So the power has shifted. Not only is there the financial pressure, but the actual control has shifted from physicians to non-physician leaders, which also, I think, has made the medical practice interesting. I think there are a lot of examples of that, and I feel that the medical chart is really a metaphor in many ways of some of these transitions. I think the medical chart was designed as a communication tool, 
and it now is a primary instrument for billing yes. and also from metric management of care and physicians yes. and providers. So there is this big conflict. And I'm just curious if you've thought about trying to be solutions focused to this situation. Are there opportunities where we can turn things to the benefit of patients and make care better? I think so. But one of the first things that we ought to recognize is that there have been now, again, research studies that demonstrate that while electronic medical records, of course, are now part of medical practice everywhere, the burden on physicians is disproportionately felt by physicians in the United States. So compared to other advanced industrialized countries, which are practicing state-of-the-art medicine and have all of the requirements to make sure and track patient outcomes and everything else, U.S. physicians have to spend way more time on all of these things, answering emails and doing a data entry and whatever. And so I think there's obviously, compared to other industrialized countries, an opportunity for improvement. When Amir Rubin took over One Medical, one of the first things he did was hire about a hundred software people and to try to change a lot of the workflow and to try to make it easier for physicians to both keep track of what they were doing, but also to remove the burdens off them. One Medical, of course, is now bought by Amazon and Amir has left One Medical. I think the fundamental issue is, are you going to have the technology serve the physicians in medical practice, are you going to design technology that basically is designed without input from the physicians or, for that matter, other medical professionals, and you have the consequences of that? I think that those shifts require people being very thoughtful about where they have leverage to press the system to move in those directions. Healthcare is really supposed to be or is patient-centered at its very core. And I think that what is this tension you've mentioned, whereas we have so many financial drivers of our healthcare system, what are the opportunities for both systems and leaders and even physicians in these systems to help promote patient-centric approaches? And I think you have some examples of leaders who've done this really well. And what does that look like? I have two friends who are now both retired from Kaiser Permanente. One is Robbie Pearl and the other was Jack Cochran. Robbie ran Northern California and Jack ran was he ran Colorado and then became the physician-in-chief for all of Kaiser. And each of them has written two books. And all four books basically make the same point which, with which I agree completely, which is physicians need, which will lead us into the discussion of power, physicians need to be more at the center of all of these health systems. That uh, in many instances, I think doctors have said, I went into medicine to practice medicine. I don't want to be in administration. I don't want to be involved in these things. I just want to do my science and my, and my patient practice and that will be fine. But as physicians have maybe pulled back or been pushed back or some combination of push and pull, the control and the decision logics have shifted in ways that I don't think favor physicians or, for that matter, patients. And one of the themes that I often, when I talk to physician groups about, I say physicians need power. And you have to lean into power, you have to learn how to do power, and you have to say, I want to be in a position of power, because otherwise the logic is going to be made by finance or private equity and, and patient care, and the quality of care is not going to get the emphasis that it deserves. You've mentioned before in other conversations that there are these elements of power, you can say you don't want to participate in it, but you are ultimately receiving the whole context of it. So I think it's hard not to engage. And I think that's an important yeah. quality, even if it feels uncomfortable. These are realities of our world that we yeah. need to understand and engage with. You can either do power or power will be done to you. <laughs> that is exactly true. Moving on, I think that this has been a very large source of frustration. These 
power dynamics in the healthcare profession for physicians, and I think has challenged many, and maybe even led to burnout and concern. You've just written a book a couple of years ago called Dying for Paycheck, where you talked about the workforce in general and how the impact of the workforce can cause stress and health problems and actually even maybe decreased productivity. And that this is happening in our general workforce, but also how does this play out in our healthcare workforce? It plays out tremendously. Physician burnout is a huge problem. It's been documented extensively, but what I have often said to people, which doesn't always make them happy, is that documenting the problem is necessary but insufficient to solving it. My sense is that there are many organizations that believe the physician burnout is like the sun rising in the east. There's nothing that can be done. I don't actually agree with that at all. It's been documented and the consequences have been documented. Primary care doctors in particular seem to be leaving. Other doctors are also leaving the profession. The rate of suicide among physicians is twice the rate for the general population, as you probably know. And there's also studies, which would not surprise anybody, that demonstrate that the physicians that are burned out make more errors. So physician burnout is an issue that ought to be addressed rather than just measured. I think that it's not only a risk to patients, but I think you've also mentioned it's actually inefficient for the system. You mentioned that the workplace is maybe the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. I think that was one of the That's quotes correct. from your book. Um, and I guess that being said, the amount of health care costs related. So maybe the system's not even working for patients, but it also is maybe financially inefficient if we're causing all these health care issues. People don't do their best work when they're tired or exhausted or burned out or stressed. Work, workplaces in general have not made good accommodation to take care of people and to worry about their well-being, which is a phrase that Gallup often uses and the, the, the various components of well-being. And that includes both physical and mental health. Part of the issue with physicians is when they're done with their, in quotes, formal day, they have all the hours of charting that they're supposed to do. So I think work hours has been found to be a, a health risk. Layoffs, of course, are a health risk. Work family conflict or is a health risk, the absence of job control. At one point, I think physicians had more autonomy than they have today, given all the measures and pressures and the financial pressures that we've already alluded to. So all of these things are risk factors for behavioral and physical health. In sports, we understand the connection between health, both physical and psychological, and performance. But that connection occurs in all kinds of environments, not just in sports. And we ought to be concerned about the health, both physical and mental, of our workforce. Nobody in any organization, and certainly not physicians, can do their best work if they're not healthy. Yeah, we have a sense of high performance in many of, especially you have a lot of high acuity centers where you have very high acuity patients being taken care of. I think this is a really important issue. The question is, how do we empower? People often feel like this is just the way it is and there's nothing that can be done about it. How do we empower physicians and, and leaders in the healthcare space to recognize where there are opportunities to promote change and why this needs to be done? There was a former baseball commissioner who said, as a quote with which, which I agree, power is 20% granted and 80% taken. So if physicians are going to be have more power in the healthcare system, which is what Jack Cochran and Robbie Pearl both think they should have, and I can see the logic for that, you cannot sit back and wait for someone to say, oh, Dr. Oaks, I think it would be nice to give you more influence. You're going to have to be, I think, more proactive. And I think physicians need to be more proactive. And that means getting education that permits them to go into leadership positions. And then they need to lean into those leadership roles. They can't say, I don't want to do this, or I'm going to leave this uh, to these other people. And they need to be much more proactive. They need to try to get themselves on health system and hospital boards of directors, become a little bit more ambitious around occupying leadership positions. 
I love that. And as someone who also helps develop physicians to move into those leadership spaces, I think it's really important. I think there's a question, do you move into leadership positions and work within the current systems to change the current systems? I know there's been a movement more in medicine, and I think we've had a number of medical training programs unionize, and even some practicing physician groups have unionized. Many other healthcare professional groups have unionized. What do you think about that trend as a way to assert collective power? Is that, is that a viable solution in medical systems? What are the problems with that, or what are the advantages? It's an issue of one for all and all for one. I think collective voice is always more effective than individual voice. I think it is hard to get system change if you're just one individual. It is obviously easier if you speak as, as a group. And I'm not sure if that means you need to be in a union as opposed to some other thing, but you do need to do something to organize your colleagues to speak with one voice. I like that coordinating and collaborating and and using constructively the power you have to move organizations in the directions you want to go. And I think that's a really important, and that's actually a nice segue, I think, into where we individually have power. We often feel as members of organizations that you know we're just cogs in this system and it's sometimes hard when you're here trying to do your job, figuring out how do you move those levers. How do you get people over that worry that it's unethical to use power? How do you get them into the place where they can understand that this is something that can be used for good? I begin the book Seven Rules of Power with a quote which is attributed to me, and I guess I will take credit for it, which is that if power is going to be used for good, more good people need power. Decisions are going to be made about pay and schedules and technology and values and all the other aspects of the organization's culture. All these decisions are going to be made. So the question is not, are they going to be made or not? The simple question is, who is going to have influence on those decisions? There's the study that demonstrated how few physicians were now running health systems also had data in that same article, which I think was published in JAMA, that talked about how health systems that are run by physicians have better performance, have better patient outcomes. So it is, again, there's a connection. When health systems are run buy doctors for the benefits of patients, uh, you get better outcomes than when health systems are run uh, by people who are interested only in how much money they can extract. I, and so to empower the physician workforce and maybe other healthcare professionals in the workforce to know that they are connected to the positive outcomes could be very powerful. I'm curious, how do we get there? <laughs> I think people need to be reminded about the data Bob Sutton and I wrote a book on evidence-based management. Evidence-based practices be something that physicians resonate with very well. And some years ago, I gave a talk at the Mayo Clinic, and when I was giving this lecture, a very senior administrator at Mayo said to me, it's interesting, the doctors have to practice according to the best evidence, but the administrators don't. And many administrative practices are not evidence-based at all. And so one of the things I think we need to do is hold administrators also to account so that if they say we're going to do X or Y or Z to have data supporting that. I sometimes say that great leaders make change and bad leaders make excuses. And many people make excuses for why things have to be the way they are. I have to use Epic. I have to do this. I can't do that. I have to whatever. And people like Amir Rubin or my friend Rudy Crew, who ran New York City schools and other amazing organizational leaders who say, we will not make excuses for why things that need to happen can't be done. We will figure out a way, maybe not all at once, maybe not perfectly, but we will slowly make change to get there. The 100,000 Lives Project was the Institute of Healthcare Improvement said there are too many people dying from atrogenic causes, and we are going uh, to do some simple things, uh, and by the way, we're going to do them now. We're going to do things to elevate patients' beds and to make sure that we do the right operation on the right body part for the right person and do all these little simple things that turned out to actually save more than 100,000 lives a year. And similarly, I think there's too much physician burn 
burnout. There is the healthcare system is not really oriented around the doctors and patients. What are we going to do about it? Let's stop making excuses and make some change. I love the concept of dealing with the frustrations that many people have in their field with giving people agency and Correct. giving them agency through showing them where their opportunities for power are. Let's talk a little bit about your book, Seven Rules of Power, and maybe you could outline for us what does the structure of power look like, what's the bare bones of that, and what, where are the opportunities? I think the first rule of power is to get out of your own way. And getting out of your own way is to get beyond imposter syndrome. I don't deserve to be the CEO of the hospital or whatever. Getting beyond your own way means not describing yourself in ways that disempower you by saying, I'm only a this or a that. Getting out of your own way means not worrying excessively about whether everybody likes you and approves of what you're doing. Your job as a senior leader is to enhance performance and to drive change. You drive change, enhance performance, not everybody's gonna be happy. Some people are happy underperforming. Some people, many people are happy with the status quo, which is why it's the status quo. First, get out of your own way and be willing to do what is required uh, to make change. The second rule is to break the rules. All social change was driven by people who broke the rules. Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail was written while he was in jail. Nelson Mandela became the father of South Africa while he was in Robin prison. Social change is driven by people who say, I am not going to accept the current rules. And in the words of Laura Esserman, who basically says exactly the same thing, who made the damn rules in the first place? Patience is both a virtue and but also a vice. And sometimes you could be too patient in making organizational change. So I think you need to, I think you need to break the rules. That's rule number two. I would yeah. say for rule number two, it's a good one for physicians to think about. We've been trained our whole professional life up until the point where we get our jobs is to follow rules. There's hoops you jump through. And so we got here by following the rules. And so I think it's a real phase change in your thinking as professional to understand that now in your environment to actually do your job well, you may have to think differently about it. Yeah. Again, Laura, Laura Esterman says to me, and I don't know this because I'm not a doctor, but she said basically everything I learned about breast cancer when I went to medical school 25, 30 years ago has now been turned on its head. That's a wonderful example. So if, if all you did was treat patients in for every disease in every instance in the same way that you had done it 25 or 30 years ago, there would be no progress. So progress comes out of people saying, our outcomes are insufficiently good. What are some ways of doing things more efficiently, better, with better cure rates and better outcomes and whatever? And progress is made by people saying, this is we, we have to do better. Rule three, of course, is to act and speak with power. We respond to people on the basis of their body language. We respond to people in terms of how they sound. The confidence is often confused with competence, but because of that, you have to behave in, in a confident fashion. And there are, there are certain rules about how you present yourself and how you show up. You want to act and speak with power. You want to, I think, build a powerful brand we think about brands with respect to products, but individuals have brands as well. What do you stand for? How does your current life and what you're doing or aspire to do fit in with your personal background and your trajectory and what you know and what you've done? And it's interesting how people often won't, aren't willing to brand themselves. So I think you need to brand. Uh, rule five is, of course, network relentlessly. If leadership is about getting things done, through other people. The more people you know, and the more people who are part of your network, the better able you're gonna be able to get things done. Leadership is about social relationships, and you need to build social relationships with people, and the more people you have connections with, the better off you're gonna be. Rule six, of course, is use your power. You are not given responsibility just to sit there. You have to do things with it. Jim Collins in Good to Great talks about Getting the right people on the bus. Getting the right people on the bus sometimes means getting the wrong people off the bus. You have to make sure that the people that you are working with are aligned with what needs to get done and are aligned with each other. And rule seven is that once you achieve power and success, how you got there, nobody's going to care about. I think people worry too much about the long-run consequences of achieving a position of leadership or power 
But in the meantime, I think you need to get out of your own way and, and build the social relationships and create the resources that, that will make you powerful. There are often people hear these rules and see some of the realities of people using power, and they find it, they see it in a sort of cynical light. I, I see it in a very positive light because I think, as you have said, the, the interesting thing about power is that anybody can use it. As you were saying earlier, it's 80% for the taking. And so I think it, it can actually level the playing field in really important ways to encourage and teach all of us to have access to that. I'll let you fill in. The word that comes to my mind is a word that you used earlier, and I think it's a very important word, and that word is agency, to get people to step up, to, to, to believe that they can do stuff that they didn't think they could do, and to try things that they didn't think they could try, certainly in the healthcare system, to try to get people to take more responsibility for and control over what goes on in that healthcare system. I think often people get stuck at the place where they need to wait till someone else does something. And I think the more we can realize that thing may never get done, so what can we do? What's within our power? Where are the leverage points? And I think we haven't been trained to think that way. We're trained to use evidence to manage sophisticated aspects of disease. But I think this is a really important skill set if we're going to be able to do our job well in our current environment. Yeah. There was a series of studies done some years ago called the Whitehall Studies, based on the British Civil Service, um, in which Sir Michael Marmot, a British epidemiologist, found that the higher your rank in the civil service, your lower your risk of cardiovascular disease or dying from a heart attack. And why was that? It turns out it's job control. It is about the control over your work environment. It's very stressful to be in a position where you don't have much control over what you do and how and when you do it. And so to the extent that physicians have lost elements of control over their work, it's not surprising at all that burnout has gone up because they don't have the autonomy they once had, they don't have the control over the work environment that they once had, they don't have a control over the institutions in which they work that they once had. When the doctors are in better shape, the patients get much better care and the finances are much better. I think that's a wonderful way to say how this is a line you don't have to have an either or. And I think though you do have to have a will to push the leverage of the system into the correct directions. And I do feel like that's the responsibility of hopefully physicians and health professionals throughout the system. As we wrap up, I just want to ask you, is there any additional thoughts you have about how physicians can learn these skills, how they can adopt uh, these ideas into their everyday life? First of all, I think if you want to be a leader, most leaders have, uh, many leaders have coaches. You get yourself some executive coaching. Just as physicians have educated themselves and continue to educate themselves about how the organization of healthcare affects healthcare outcomes, how the, the, the issues around administration, the issues around how much time physicians are spending on email and with medical records and comparing that to other countries. They need knowledge. And then they need to find a set of colleagues that they can work together with to make change. That is a wonderful message. I love the idea that we have the power. We just have to connect with our sense of it and give ourselves permission to take hold and and give ourselves the agency to make the change that we think is important to take care of our patients. Mm. Thank you so much. This is a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you.